Hi, I'm Susie Larson. Thank you for listening to Susie Larson Live. Faith Radio podcasts are only possible because of your support. So thanks for giving and thanks for sharing with a friend. It's only just a matter of Welcome to Susie Larson Live. Always so honored to get to spend this time with you. In fact, I look forward to bringing you conversations every single day that hopefully inspire you in your faith walk, that deepen your understanding of God's Word, and that heightens your awareness of His very real presence in your life. Well, God wants you and I to be overcomers, but how will that be possible if we have nothing to overcome? We can either spend our days looking at the wind and the waves and the giant mountains that loom before us, or we can look to Jesus for our instruction because he's the one who's going to teach us how to navigate our trials. He'll instruct us on how to navigate the times. He's the one who helps us overcome. I love today's topic. It's on overcoming. Author and Pastor Matt Chandler joins me today to talk about his book, The Overcomers, God's Vision for You to Thrive in an Age of Anxiety and Outrage. The book is so good. I'm only several chapters in. I feel like we probably could do four shows on this topic. So I'm praying Pastor Matt uh, sometime in the future can come back and pick up where we left off because there's so much here. But this is what he writes. We're not victims. We're overcomers. And we are a key part of what God is working out in our day. We're uniquely wired and uniquely placed in this moment in history as part of God's big plan to push back darkness and to establish light. Christ has overcome, and in him, we too are overcomers. I think I'm just going to start off by asking for an amen. Somebody got to give me an amen. If you're battling fear, if you find yourself looking to the left and right, from this news network to the next news network, to scrolling that ties your gut up in knots, and you find yourself where you've lost peace, you've lost hopeful expectancy, you're mostly living in anxiety and fear and that perpetual cycle. Um, This book will be a great encouragement to you. We've got a handful of copies to give away. I'll give you the title again, The Overcomers, God's Vision for You to Thrive in an Age of Anxiety and Outrage. Text the word book to get in on the drawing, 877 933 2484. Quick announcement before we hear from our guest today. If you've got a loved one that you've been praying for for years who's just yet to trust Jesus, or maybe you've got a prodigal who once worshiped God, followed Jesus, and has walked away, um, we care about you. We want so much to do this journey with you. So I've recorded 15 audio texts. They're about two to three minutes long. Just to encourage you on this journey, they're free. You just text the word HEART and then we will send them. Or you'll get a couple texts per week. Again, just a two to three minute audio. I talk about things like taking care of your soul, praying a prayer of release, forgiving where that is appropriate, those kinds of things. Again, text the word HEART to 877-933-2484. And I already see the amens coming in. So this is going to be a good show. Buckle up, friends. Let me tell you about my guest. We'll get him on the show. Matt Chandler is husband, father, pastor, elder, and author whose greatest desire is to make much of Jesus. He served over 20 years as lead pastor at the Village Church in Flower Mound, Texas, which recently, interesting, transitioned its five campuses into their own autonomous churches. He also is the executive chairman of the Acts 29 Network. It's a large church planting community that trains and equips church planters across the globe. Pastor Matt, it's been a very long time since we've talked. Welcome back to the show. Good to talk with you today. It has been way too long, Susie. It's good to be back. Good to hear from you. Well, congratulations on a phenomenal book. Oh, thank you. I'm glad you like it because it was work. Oh. Not all of them are work like this one was work. A labor of love. Yeah, I <laughs> yes, find ma'am. I get attacked in the very areas that I tend to write in. You know what I mean? I'm tested in those places. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, boy, I can't wait to talk with you about it. We share the same publisher, too. Aren't they just amazing? I love them They so really much. are. Incredible. Yeah, so good. All right. Well, before we dig into the content of your book, I'd love to know, just in your time with the Lord these days, what's he been impressing upon your heart? Oh, man. I am. It's funny because I was just having this conversation with Lauren, my wife, last night. I, I think, the, I don't think, I I tend to run at a pace um, that that I think the Lord would rather me not run as quick and would like me to slow down a bit. Um, and, and I think that's for all sorts of reasons. I think I hear him better when I'm slow. Uh, I think I'm more present when I'm slow, but I've got this kind of 
and I've had it since I was a little kid, it, like this frenetic energy in me that he is sanctifying in this season, mm, teaching wow. me the value of silence, of solitude, of um, getting away to to where I'm not going to see anybody or um, have any kind of technological connections and and just learning to sit with him um, instead of serve him. <laughs> and mm. so, um, which is really sweet and for my personality type, really difficult. Yeah. Boy, that's beautiful. It just shows you how much he loves you and how much he likes you. Oh, you know? right. It's I mean, so, it's so cool. Yeah. Like yeah. he likes me. I don't, I don't think I, I think I've, I have received and delighted in him and blown away by his love for decades but this is a season where, like you just said, it's not just love. Like he, he actually likes me, mm-hmm. uh, like finds me uh, amusing and um, <laughs> w- wants to hang out. And that's, that's so the, great. that's mm-hmm. even crazier to me than just mm-hmm. love. I mean, I get, I, but like, but I understand I have kids. It's one thing for them to know. I love them. It's another for them to know I actually enjoy them and want mm-hmm. to be with them. And one, I mean, that's a different thing. And I'm I'm getting that gift in this season. Praise God. That's why it's so worth it to listen to him because it seems at oh, times so when we feel it. like we want to run, he's like, not yet. You know, I'm going to have your rest. Yeah. And other times I have felt I need rest. He's like, not yet. I need you to not rise yet. up. You got some in the tank. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Let's do this. <laughs> so I would love to know, I mean, you're a busy guy. Um, how was this message of overcoming born in your heart? Oh man, I was, um, I was actually out. We have a place out on the Brazos river about two hours from where I live. It's just become a refuge. And, um, it was in that 2020 season where like everything felt discombobulated. And, um, I was trying to faithfully serve the people in front of me and, and I could just see, uh, I don't know if I want to use the word trauma. I, I don't know what's the right word, but but I could see the fear, uncertainty, and um, anxiety, and in some cases, the rage or outrage of our day, mm. um, moving in on them, and and the what I was seeing. The only word I know how to describe it is like paralysis. Yeah, that because that was I think. It certainly, even if I think about my own 20 something years of pastoral ministry, that, that was the first time that I wasn't wrong. I was evil. Um, and, and I think they were feeling that too, that if you disagreed with this stance or that stance, whether you were, were you were talking about what other Christians thought or what the world thought, you, you weren't labeled as wrong. You were labeled as evil. Yeah. Um, and that, mm-hmm. yes. And that mm-hmm. was so disruptive to kind of the missional zeal of the men and women that I'd been pastoring for two decades, um, that what I was noticing happening was paralysis. Uh, and so they weren't acquiescing to the culture. They weren't, you know, all of a sudden, you know, moving to a more progressive stance on this or that, that it just seemed if I could overgeneralize it, they were giving themselves over to doom scrolling and binging things on Netflix rather than leaning into this moment that that God had made for us. And um, I, I'd happened to be in my own journey through the book of Revelation at the time that was provoking me in all sorts of ways. Um, and so I came back um, from the, the river cabin, having communed with the Lord for several days out there, four or five days out there. And I knew I was preaching this book. And, wow. um, so came to the elders, to our comm team, to all that. And just said, I, I don't want to preach Romans this year. I want to preach through the book of revelation, which everyone was like, say what? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I, I want to preach through the book of revelation. I don't think it's saying what a lot of us think it's saying. I don't think it's scary. Now I think it's the most courage giving worship stirring, um, let's go get after it. King Jesus book in the Bible. And mm-hmm. so I want to preach it. And so we set it up and I, in 2021 started preaching through this and Susie, I, I've been preaching for 30 years. It felt like I was caught up in something 
Yeah. Uh, I don't know that I'd ever seen what I saw those 12 weeks. And then outside of the village, it was creating this weight. And and I think it's easily the most downloaded thing I've ever done. And wow. um, and and then I was actually working on a different book, a book on friendship with Jesus, you know, going back to some of the things I was letting you know the Lord's been teaching me in this season. And I had two friends, um, both kind of well-known evangelical leaders reach out to me and say, whatever you're doing, stop it and write this. And, um, and so that, that's what I did. In fact, one of them actually even called my agent and said, Hey, tell him to stop doing that one he's working on and tell him to do this one. Um, and then that, that set into motion, you know, preaching and writing are two very different skills. And so, um, then turned my attention to trying to turn this series into a book. Um, and that, that. that brought yeah. this thing about. And so that's kind of the heart behind it. And how it happened. And yeah. And isn't it interesting, Pastor, that it came out of a place of rest? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I mean, yeah, it hadn't, that's not lost on me. That That's yeah. another one of those. See, if you'll slow down and hear me, I'll, I'll, mm. I'll be here for this. <laughs> well, you know, really the overarching theme in the book is that as well, that he's, he's an ever present help. He's so That's with right. us and man makes his plans, but the Lord determines his steps. And, you know, That's authors it. can go, what's the felt need? Let's write about that. But if you got your finger on the pulse of heaven, if you really are listening, Lord, what, what's a word in due season? You see it, you just see it manifest in a way that has life on it, you know? And yeah. uh, boy, you have your own friends saying, whatever it is you're doing, stop. You know? Yeah. Well, I have to be writing a book about friends, but okay. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll cut you out of this That's chapter. Right. <laughs> That's right. That is awesome. Well, we've got a few minutes here before our first break, but I, I opened the show with this excerpt. I'm going to read it again and just have you comment on it. You said, we are not victims, but overcomers. And we are a key part of what God is working out in our day. We are uniquely wired and uniquely placed in this moment in history as part of God's big plan to push back darkness and establish light. Christ has overcome, and in him, we too are overcomers. Say a bit more about that. Yeah, well, I I mean, the thing I'm trying to shout from the rooftops everywhere right now is like we were made like we were born for this moment. And and here's yeah. the Here's the thing that I'm trying to convince people of. Christianity hasn't spread across the globe through blue check, charismatic, extrovert personality types. It's spread across the globe through the faithful, everyday presence of men and women who see Jesus as beautiful and live out of that truth, goodness, and beauty on streets, in office cubicles, in shops, in places where you work out and train, in, in gyms, watching kids play, that, that the gospels kind of spread across the world. 2.38 billion Christians worldwide. And that didn't happen because of extroverts. It, it happened because housewives were faithful in their neighborhoods. And as they sat around with other mothers and welders um, took the hope of the gospel to the shop. And and people who trained jiu-jitsu or did CrossFit or did rock climbing took the gospel into those places and showed with their lives and with their mouth the love, mercy, and forgiveness of Jesus made available to all who would turn to him as Lord and Savior. And, and it feels like maybe especially in Western culture— with all of our blue checks and Instagram and big conferences and loud music and that it gets lost on everyday average Christians living in normal places that aren't Instagram worthy. I mean, I'm in Dallas. There, there, there ain't anything. The best part about Dallas is wherever you go outside of Dallas is remarkably <laughs> beautiful. And, um, and, and I'm just trying to say, like, if, if someone's listening to this right now, they're a stay at home mom. Praise God. What what a place that he's uniquely wired you and placed you to be. He's uniquely gifted you. Like you've got a big heart in this story. You're not a bit player in God's plan to push back darkness. I, I just would love for you to know that about yourself and walk in the courage and zeal that should come when you know that, that God has uniquely wired you and placed you for this exact moment. Wow. Somebody again, 
got to text me an amen. As we go to break, I want to say a word to that person. You feel like a nobody because we live in a celebrity-driven culture, unfortunately, that's very much infiltrated Christian Christianity as well. But as Pastor Matt is saying, God sees you right where you live in your space. And as you fill your space, you run your race. What Pastor Matt says in this book, Overcomers, is that you can actually be braver than you think. You actually are braver than you think. And there's a way to walk with a humble confidence into your sphere of influence because you're empowered by God, filled with the Spirit of God. And you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be afraid. So I'm going to have Pastor Matt speak to that on the other side. But we're talking to every one of you. You are in Christ. He's in you. You're seated with Him. And He wants to use you and work through you more than you want Him to. Pastor Matt Chandler is my guest today. His new book, The Overcomers, God's vision for you to thrive in an age of anxiety and outrage. So it's not just survive, it's not just get by, to thrive in an age of outrage and anxiety. We've got a handful of copies to give away. You can text the word book if you want in on the drawing, 877-933-2484. We'll be back in a minute. Faith Radio podcasts are produced by the listener-supported ministry of Faith Radio. If you're interested in becoming a team member, a donor to this ministry, you can support the podcast anytime and donate at myfaithradio.com. Thanks so much for tuning in to Suzy Larson Live. It's a great day today. Glad to have you listening. Talking to author, Pastor Matt Chandler, who's released a really wonderful brand new book, The Overcomers, God's Vision for You to Thrive in an Age of Anxiety and Outrage. Right before the break, he was saying how everyday people, it's not about the blue check mark on Instagram. We've totally idolized, I think, the celebrity culture. He's saying where change is happening, where the gospel is going, so more often is the everyday Christian living out their call. And Kathleen says, that's me. And she said, I love my mission field. It's my neighborhood because I'm a mama at home. And we just honor and applaud you, Kathleen. Pastor, I'm thinking about that person who, because you say, you know, we don't have to be afraid of anything. We're not victims. We're not passive bystanders. What do you say to the person who says, I want that to be true, but I feel like the exact opposite is true. I'm afraid of everything. And I'd rather actually run and hide if I'm honest. (laughs) What do you say to them? Well, I, I, one, I would want to normalize what you're feeling. It's not abnormal to see the things that we're seeing all the time now. I mean, even today, I think we had another political figure. I mean, I don't think they killed him, but there was an assassination attempt and, and, and there's floods in Brazil and there's, I mean, our own culture seems to be circling the drain and it looks like chaos and it, um, and, and really the, the answer to, those kinds of one, I would just say we haven't been designed to be omnipresent. It's too mm-hmm. much of a weight wow, uh, to bear. Um, like we just haven't been designed and technology has made us in a sense omnipresent. And this makes me like it it astounds me when when you think about God's steadfast love, that has said love, like that God sees every act of evil all the time. And and he never just destroys all of us, that he patiently endures and and sets his steadfast love on his people. It, it shocks me um, when I see all the madness of our day, and I can't hardly handle it, um, just trying to navigate my own small life. So some, some things that I would talk about is um, what I'm responsible for is in front of me. Um, and so that's that that's my family first, my wife and my kids. And then it's this church he's asked me to pastor. And then it's those that I interact with on a daily basis. And, and that, that needs to be my world. The world doesn't need to be my world. The country doesn't need to be my world. I need to be faithful where the Lord placed me. And so that would be the first thing. Um, when it comes to the book and what I'm talking about in the book is, um, you know, revelation for a lot of people is a very scary thing because you get the trumpets and the bowls and you get all of this kind of apocalyptic language of pain and death and disease. And but but the call to the people of God throughout the book of Revelation 
is to fix their eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. In fact, one of my favorite scenes um, in the book of Revelation um, is the throne room of God. And and you've got um, John transported up to see this thing. Revelation doesn't read in a linear Western way. Uh, it comes a series of windows that John sees. And he, he's taken up and he's shown the throne room of God. And there are these 24 little thrones around there representing the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles. Think all of human history. And there's this scroll that no one can open. And John begins to weep like how... How can we fix this madness? How, what what can become uh, of the human condition? We're stuck. We're broken. What can happen? So John's weeping, and a voice comes out from the throne that tells John to weep no more, for the Lion of Judah is worthy to open the scroll. And John turns, and he doesn't see the Lion of Judah. Well, he does, but he sees a slain lamb, that the Lion of Judah is the slain lamb. And then what you see emanating from this throne that Christ is seated on right now, not in the future, right now, it is his reigning, ruling victory over every principality and power in this world. Like all, all, all that's broken in the universe is moving towards this throne and emanating from this throne is his victory, his power, his beauty, and his grace. There's this beautiful rainbow uh, behind the throne. And what's emanating? Forgiveness, power, victory, majesty is emanating from the throne. And, and then from there, you have these four horsemen of the apocalypse begin to ride. And they're terrible, right? It's antichrists and war and famine and pestilence and disease. And then there's this there's this question that comes in light of all the brokenness of the world. And the question was, in light of these things, who can stand? This is Revelation chapter 6. And the um, what we see in 6, right before that question's asked, is it's not the kings who can stand. It's not the famous. It's not the pretty. It's not the powerful. It's not slave or free. None of those can stand in the face uh, of the hardship of this world. But then chapter 7 answers the question in light of these things who can stand. And, and he answers the question by showing the people of God across time and space gathered in front of this throne room with all of their attention on King Jesus. So their attention is fixed on him and they begin to sing to him and worship him as enthroned and on high. And, and I love this scene, and, and I think it's a it's a good thing to remember this scene, because the answer to the question in light of all this hardship, pain, difficulty, and anxiety, who can stand? The people of God can stand, and not only do they stand, but they sing in the face of the schemes of the enemy and reveal them to be weak and pedantic. And when I read that, it struck me as a pastor oh my gosh, this is exactly what we do. Um, what do we do at funerals? We sing. What do we do when a loved one's in hospice and they've only got a little bit longer to live? We gather around their bed. And I have never done that where we have not ended up singing while we were there. If you want to apply it more kind of structurally or systemically, I write about this in the book. If you think about that, that dark season of chattel slavery here, in I mean, dark, unjust, gross evil. But man, there are hundreds and hundreds of Negro spirituals that are singing in the face of their oppression. Uh, the one I quote in the book, I will sing all along the way is basically going, listen, God's going to deliver us from this and we're going to sing and worship him until he does. And so one of our responses when, when, we're, um, when we're feeling overwhelmed, either in our own little personal lives or in, um, in, in what we're seeing out there in our towns, countries, cities, whatever, is to return our attention to Christ enthroned. Like we're not worshiping six pound, eight ounce, sweet baby Jesus. We're worshiping the King of Kings and Lord of Lords over all things. And nothing, nothing will be able to refuse to bow before his majesty, authority, and power. And we are beloved by him. We are delighted in by him. And, and sometimes this is a community project. Um, so together 
what the church does. And this should be happening when we gather, but it, it can happen just with you. Instead of navel gazing or looking at the horizon, we can, as the writer of Hebrews says, fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, so, so that our orientation to the world is not around the circumstances of our lives, but the king of our lives. And when we do that, either by ourselves or as families or with close friends, our hearts are encouraged and built up in courage, even in the face of fear or tired or anxiety, or you name the emotion. I didn't even have to ask for amens, and I'm getting amens on the text line. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. And my producer says, I got to break out in song right now. And then she lists the lyrics from the song, Is Anyone Worthy? Is Anyone Whole? That's it. Is anyone able are, to break it. the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave. He was David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. Is he worthy? Is he worthy of all blessing and honor and glory? Is he worthy of this? He is. I could cry. That's so amazing. <laughs> wow. Isn't it? Well, Pastor, when we come back from the break, I would love for you, as much as you're comfortable, sharing from your own backstory of things you've had to overcome, because you're not writing this just because you read it out of Scripture. Reading out of Scripture is everything. Uh, God's Word is living yeah. and breathing, but it's not theoretical is what I'm saying. It's very personal to you, because you've, you ever, as we all have had our own battles, what have you had to overcome and how have you found God faithful? I'd love for you to share. Talking to author and pastor Matt Chandler. And thank you for these texts. It's so awesome to see you respond as Ange and I are jumping up and down, um, trying to restrain ourselves as we think about that. Think about it. I mean, get to Hebrews 11 and 12 and just consider what's going on in the heavenly realm right now. There's a joyful assembly singing, holy, holy is the Lord. And uh, that's our reality. It's amazing. It's amazing. Wow. Pastor Matt Chandler is my guest. The Overcomers is his book. Subtitle is God's Vision for You to Thrive in an Age of Anxiety and Outrage. And that is just the goal, that you could thrive in an age of anxiety and outrage. But you don't default to those places. You don't just happen upon those places. You literally have to apply yourself to the truth of Scripture and guard your inputs. Uh, more with Matt Chandler in a moment. Pray you're having a really blessed day. Thanks for tuning in to Susie Larson Live. We're talking to author Pastor Matt Chandler, who's written a really phenomenal book titled The Overcomers, God's Vision for You to Thrive in an Age of Anxiety and Outrage. Got a handful of copies to give away today. If you want in on the drawing, just text the word book to 877-933-2484. It'll kick back a link for you to enter the drawing. This is what Matt writes. Despite when you and I may see, God is at work in the mess of our world and our everyday lives. Believe it or not, God is accomplishing his purposes. He's seeking and saving the lost. He's exacting justice on his creation. He's working miracles among the sick and the brokenhearted. He's pouring out his grace and forgiveness on all of us. At this very moment, God is calling people into a deeper relationship with him, one that's built on the power and the authority of Jesus Christ. And here's the crazy part. You have been called right into the center of this ultimate reality. So powerful. Pastor, if you don't mind, I'd love for you to share about just what you've learned personally about overcoming and how Jesus has met you in some of your battles. Oh, man. I I mean, I, I think I could think of three or four seasons uh, over the last, gosh, I've been following Jesus for, I think, 33 years now, 32, 33 mm -hmm. years now. Um, I, I think ones that, that might resonate the most with are, you know, the men and women who are joining us today is um, the first seven years of my marriage with Lauren were just a disaster. Um, and I, I think, I mean, I know I was laying in bed at night thinking, oh my goodness, is this the rest of my life? And, and listen, she wasn't laying next to me thinking all of her girlhood dreams had come true. <laughs> um, and so we had each, hmm brought a specific kind of baggage into our marriage. Lauren had like an overnight bag and I had a couple of locomotives behind me. Mm -hmm. And although we both deeply loved Jesus and were very much committed to the covenant, it, it was a very cold, difficult seven years while we were in ministry. I mean, it wasn't like I wasn't doing ministry back then. Um, and that 
that season of feeling like I, I didn't have the, I, I hadn't even had the time to build the kind of close godly counsel friends that I have right now back then. And so we both felt very alone. Um, I didn't know who to talk to, you know, that could, could I lose my job if people knew we were struggling? And then L- Lauren's very much, um, at least back then, very much um, a, a people pleaser perfectionist. And so she was feeling pressure to perform um, like everything was great. I'm not as good at that, but I, but I was fearful of what that might mean if people knew how bad we were struggling. Um, and so that was a period of time in which the Lord really drew near to us both, really sanctified and showed us some things that were kind of on the long-term docket to heal in us and out of us. Um, and here we are celebrating 25 years of marriage this July and and could not be, you know, we've got one married, my son just graduated, he walks Friday night, we've got a 14-year-old who's a, finished her freshman year, and we couldn't be closer friends, more in love, more glad-hearted that he gave us to one another um, mm-hmm. in, in this kind of lifelong covenant um, to, to be a picture of Jesus's covenant faithfulness to his church. So that was my first, like in my whole life, my, my first significant, I cannot get myself out of this. Um, I'm, I'm a, I I understand who I am. I'll be 50 in June. I'm a good leader. I'm a good preacher. And, and I could not fix or figure out what was happening in my marriage. First time in my life that happened to me, certainly the first time in my Christian life that happened to me. And so we both felt stuck. We, we kept trying to fix it and making it worse. Um, and, and by his grace, um, there was some significant breakthrough that happened uh, first in my heart and then in hers. Um, mm-hmm. And that was a season uh, of overcoming for sure, because we didn't know how long we would be in it. Um, and it turned out by the grace of God, it was only seven years. So for some people listening, seven years seems like forever. And for somebody who's been in this kind of marriage for 20 or 30 years, seven years feels like spring break. Um, but that was our season seven. Um, in 2009, I was diagnosed with malignant brain cancer, and so I had uh, a full resection on my right frontal lobe, 18 months of high-dose chemotherapy, and I was given two to three months to live. Um, that that was a particularly difficult season. Um, the Lord was kind. He was near. He, just so beautiful in that. Sometimes, sometimes I miss that. Um, I don't want to go back, <laughs> but sometimes I miss that. Clarity that you get when as Moses, you know, we read about Moses in, in the Psalms saying, teach me to number my days um, and to stand on that precipice and and lean into his grace was a really beautiful season that in all honesty, I hope I never do again. And, um, and then more recently um, from 2015 to, to write about 2020, I, I just felt I was, and I don't know if this ever happened to you, I was just in a funk and I don't, I I think I'd made some mistakes as a leader in 2015. I'd realized I'd hurt people that I'd unintentionally hurt. Um, And that made me nervous about my prophetic edge. You know, that thing, everything loves, everybody loves about that about me. And I felt afraid of it. I, and so I stopped the, the way I'm, I'm trying to even now form language around it is I, it's like I shifted down into second gear and then I didn't realize I was in second gear. And so I wasn't leading with conviction as much. I was playing down to the cynics rather than leading those who were serious about chasing Jesus. And I was just stuck until 20. 20. Really, one of the things that ki- the silver linings for me in the world stopping is things got slow and the Lord could begin to address some deeper things in my spirit. Mm, um, so good and so way. then I had to, and then I had to, after five years of not leading convictionally, um, wonder if this team that had built around me in that season would be able to handle or understand me coming back in fourth or fifth gear and how to how to navigate that space. And so that was the that was the more recent. I mean, 5 years is a long time to feel stuck 
and and for my personality type um feel um dampered and like i was running on you know quicksand um and so those were three seasons that maybe um the people listening today might resonate with Thank you for sharing that. And I know what you mean. You can get into those places where you're so battered and you're tired that you're almost playing not to lose rather than playing to win. Yeah, you know? that's right. And, that's uh, a good way to put it. Can you think of when you look at these three situations, was there any common denominator uh, catalyst that was a turning point? Or were they, did God just sort of visit you in three very unique and different ways to kind of you know turn the tide on those seasons? Yeah. I, so in each case, there, there was a process of things more than there was a singular moment. Um, and so actually I think 2020 was, again, I was out at the river cabin and the Lord just kindly asked me a series of questions through study. And, um, and it was in that season that it, it was like fatherly like questions that were real concerning to my soul for my soul. And, and then as I answered those questions, there was a rebuke in them. And I've always been so grateful that the way he approached my heart was to just ask some questions that were really fatherly, uh, like deep concern for my soul. And then as I answered those questions, honestly, maybe for the first time, um, he, he was able to then under this blanket of care and compassion, rebuke me for ways that I had refused to follow him. And, um, but in each case, it was more process. It was conversations. It was reading something that provoked a thought that then became, you know, how thoughts work. There's just like this little seed. And, and then I've got some really prophetic friends and, and I had a couple of those moments where prophetically people spoke into that. I believe the Lord wants me to share with you this, or this dream I had, or this, just write it down and pray into it. Um, And so in each of those instances, there was a series of things that happened over a period of time. Sometimes that that was a shorter period of time, a few weeks. In most cases, it was months and months. Wow. Thank you for sharing that, because that is so often how it goes. It's layer by layer. It's not a straight line, A to B. It's more of a journey. It's like the winding river near your cabin. I mean, really, just the way he leads us. But if we follow, he does lead us to places of restoration and healing. He's so committed to that. That's just beautiful. Yes, he does. Yeah. I want to read this paraphrase uh, or kind of a definition that you crafted based on scripture on being an overcomer. We'll have to take a break in a few minutes. So on the other side, we can talk more about it because I think it's so powerful. I have so many more questions for you, but it's been (laughs) such a great conversation. You write this, an overcomer is a believer propelled by scriptural truths, empowered by the work of Jesus and encouraged by those who've gone before them. With open eyes to deeper spiritual realities, the one who overcomes endures the brokenness of the world with holy resolve. Do you hear that, friends? We overcome and endure the brokenness of the world with a holy resolve. This individual, marked by love and through the power of the Holy Spirit, joins in God's offensive against darkness and destruction. The overcomer is an unwavering, unanxious presence. Bluntly put, the overcomer is a major problem to the enemy. Oh my goodness, I love that. We've got about three minutes before our break. Anything you want to add to that? <laughs> no, I, that. just that if you're listening to this, that is you. That that's not like that. That's not like your favorite pastor, or your favorite podcaster. All of that is available to you, purchased by the blood of Jesus, sealed in your soul by the Holy Spirit, and you need only turn into it and receive it to walk in that kind of victorious living. And and I might even use the word destiny, that you might lean into your destiny simply by turning into that and receiving it from the Lord. It's already sealed in you by the power of the Holy Spirit. You need only now take the steps of faith to believe it's true. Hmm. And I want to reiterate what you said earlier. I read the excerpt, but friend, you know, you think if you're asking as you're listening, how do I get there? I feel like this is a good answer for you. At this very moment, God is calling you into a deeper relationship with him, one that's built on the power and authority of Jesus. And here's the crazy part. You've been called right into the center of this ultimate reality. 
And right. uh, one thing, Dr. Rob Reamer, who joins us once a month uh, to talk soul care, has says that there are places God wants to take us that we can't get to on just a devotional diet, where we just sort of show right. up, do our same reading, check the box, we move on. That he wants more time and space with us because he has things he wants to show us. And uh, that's important. <laughs> so yeah, if we amen. could that is. heed the invitation. Amen. All righty. When we come back, we're going to talk about the story in Scripture in Acts 19, where there was a group of Jewish exorcists who started invoking the name of Jesus uh, into their practice. What we need to know about this story, what we can learn from it. Talking to author Pastor Matt Chandler, his book is amazing. He writes like he speaks. You'll be profoundly encouraged by it. The Overcomers, God's vision for you to thrive in an age of anxiety and outrage. We'll be back in a minute. If you listen to me often enough, you know I believe in the power of prayer. The Bible says the prayer of the righteous accomplishes great and powerful things. I am passionate about prayer, and we all need it, and we would love to pray for you. The Faith Radio team, we're serious about prayer, and we pray for specific listener requests every single week. So if you have a request, if you're walking through a difficult time, you can share your prayer request with us anonymously and securely on our website at myfaithradio.com. Thanks so much for tuning in to Suzy Larson Live, having a really rich conversation today with author, Pastor Matt Chandler. In fact, this is one. Once the live show's over and it goes to podcasts, you know we have listeners in 170 countries. You can be a radio missionary. You can share this. We make it very easy. Share it with friends. Somebody needs to hear this message today about being an overcomer. And I want to read once again Pastor Matt's description of what an overcomer is based on his study of Scripture. And I want you to personalize this. I want this to go in for you. An overcomer, that's you, is a believer propelled by scriptural truths, empowered by the work of Jesus, and encouraged by those who've gone before them. With open eyes to a deeper spiritual realities, the one who overcomes endures the brokenness of this world with holy resolve. This individual, marked by love and through the power of the Holy Spirit, joins in God's offensive against darkness and destruction. The overcomer is an unwavering, unanxious presence. Oh, I love that. Bluntly put, the overcomer is a major problem to the enemy. I love that too. So, Pastor, you write about this story in Acts 19, where there's a group of Jewish exorcists who decide to start invoking the name of Jesus into their practice of deliverance. Tell us the story and what happened. Oh, it's actually one of the wilder stories in the Bible. You you have these Jewish itinerant exorcist, which who knew that was a thing? I didn't know that was a thing, but apparently (laughs) it was a thing. And they are watching the apostle Paul cast out demons with ease. And, and they like, like, I I guess like you would do, you, you see, oh, like this guy's got some skill. What's he doing? That's different than what we're doing. Oh, he's, he's using the name Jesus. So let's do that. And so they, they find a man who's demonized um, and, and so it's seven sons of Sceva and, and they, they, they say to this demonized man, um, in the name of Paul's God, Jesus, we command you to come out. And, and then the demon speaks to, um, the, the Jewish itinerant, the seven sons of Sceva and, and says, um, Jesus, we know, and Paul we've heard of. But who are you? And then the Bible says that he overpowers them and beats them bloody and naked, which I've always, it's a fun joke to make that, you know, if you've ever watched a fight, there might be some debate over who won. But if when the fight started, you were wearing pants, and when the fight was over, you were no longer wearing pants, then no one's saying you won that fight. Yeah, you probably lost that fight. But what I wanted to draw attention to, and I think it's fascinating is that we know the demons know who Jesus is. I mean, every time he encounters them in the New Testament, they're mortified. Remember, he's like, oh, we know who you are, the Son of God. Have you come to destroy us before the appointed time? It's no true dualism. It's not like who's going to win this war. Everybody knows mm. who's going to win this war. And, and so the demons always obey, never argue, and are easily handled by Jesus. Even the ones that uh, believers are going to need to fast and pray to see any victory over them, Jesus just like, go, and they go. Yeah. Well, so it's not surprising to us that 
that they knew who Jesus was. But it's that little phrase, and I've heard of Paul, that, man, my eyes just like, wait, what? So that in the kind of demonic grapevine, you know, the the kind of gossiping around the water cooler in the demonic realm, they had heard of this guy um, anointed and empowered by the Holy Spirit that was becoming a pretty significant problem for them. And and so you've got this demonized man, this demon that begins to speak through this man. And, And the demon's like, hey, I know who that guy, I've heard of that guy. Um, and I'm trying to draw our attention to living in the kind of way where where they maybe have heard of us. And we're never going to know, and that's none of our business, and that's the Lord's stuff. I just thought it was pretty cool that yeah. here in the Apostle Paul's faithfulness to King Jesus, he had caused such ruckus among the principalities and powers that he kind of had a reputation. Powerful. So powerful. You say that there's three vital truths we've got to embrace in order to step into the destiny and the call of God on our lives. One is we're made in the image of God. Two is we are children of God. And three is truly, friends, we are uniquely wired and uniquely placed by God. Say more about those. Amen. Well, you know, everything. Um, I think the thing that Christianity has brought to the world that has made the world a better place, and I think it's an inarguable fact, is this concept of the Imago Dei, um, that human beings are made in the image of God. This is a th- this would have been an insane statement in the ancient Near East, that we are somehow like God, different than all the animals, more valuable than all the animals. And this actually, this is the standard by which every human rights, women's rights, uh, abolishment of slavery, ending of sex, right? All of it's built on this idea that we have been made in the image of God so that we are, we are, we should be receiving dignity and value just by essence of our humanity because we're like God somehow. Um, and and then I love trying to help because I think what happened, and I think it was right, is so I'll be 50 in June. So I remember when the self-esteem, uh, self-esteem stuff started. Like, I remember it. Like, you, you went from, oh, you failed that test, you need to study more, to, oh, you failed that test, we'll give you another shot at it. We don't want you to feel bad about yourself. Mm-hmm. And, and I think what ended up happening is the church – I think rightfully responded that you're not the point. Like we had to say something about expressive individualism. It's a false gospel. Right. But but the thing that got lost in that, that I think is really beautiful, um, is the fact that everyone listening to this is a, is a true, unique person person in all of human history. Like there'll never be anyone like you again. There's never been anyone like you before. You truly are uh, one of a kind. And what the Bible says about this, this is Psalm 139, uh, is that um, God is deeply involved in your personal makeup and your physical form. Uh, So Psalm 139, and I understand why, that you are fearfully and wonderfully made, that that wasn't a verse given to women's ministry. It's a verse given to the people of God. And what he says about how we're wonderfully made, uniquely and wonderfully made, is um, is that our unformed substance, so our personality type, whether we're extroverted or introverted, our fight and flight mechanisms, all that stuff, that God actually was weaving that together in our mother's womb. That that doesn't mean as Christians, we don't know how babies are made. We're saying there's something going on under the biology. And, and if you look at this unformed substance and then this kind of physical stature language in that passage, you're seeing that God is like, he's pulling from these recessive genes and, and he's pulling from these dominant genes and he's making this very unique individual and, and he's doing so according to the passage for the days that he would have for them when not yet one of them was lived. And, and so my dad, he's old and a little bit crusty. I love him. He just, you know, he, <laughs> he, he he's just gotten crustier and he, he would look at kind of the softness or his perceived softness of this generation. He's like a bunch of snowflakes. But, <laughs> but in reality, 
You, you really are. You're, you're a unique individual, only one like you. And Psalm 139 is like, yeah, because God has days that he's made for you to live into. And then if you go up to Acts 17, we were just there, uh, you know, in 19 seconds ago, but in Acts 17, in Paul's sermon oh, um, no. in Acts. We are out of time, Pastor. I'm so ah. sorry. Here we are. Come back. Right. Please come back. God come on. bless we'll, you. We'll figure it out. Yeah. Let's do it. On okay. You. Thanks uh-huh. for tuning in today, right, friends. Susie. We love and appreciate you. Have a great day. Thank you for listening to this conversation from Suzy Larson Live. These conversations are available because of your support. You can become a supporter now at MyFaithRadio.com. Please subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss any episodes and then share it with friends so together we can all have a deeper life in Christ.